Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. And uh, when we come together and, and do these episodes, you know if you've been with us for any period of time that we're having conversations about theology, about ministry, uh, about ministry leadership, about missions. And one of the conversations that we always seem to come back to is church history, and mainly because I love it. It's a really fun topic. It's enjoyable. And because I get to have conversations with Greg Axe, it's a really good excuse to sit down with him. And, and so if you were with us not long ago, you know that Pastor Greg Axe and I are in the middle of a conversation about the Inquisition. And the Inquisition being that uh, parallel movement with the Crusades, where uh, in Europe, the, the papal authority and the Roman authority worked hand in hand to go throughout Europe and to root out anything that they saw as heresy. Uh, the effects of that, though, were very, very dangerous and detrimental in that uh, the Catholic dogma ruled the day and that it profited those in power. And it was, a, it was a dangerous and wicked thing. And many people lost their lives uh, as a result of it, many innocent people. And so we're in the middle of that conversation. It's been really interesting. Today, we're going to turn our attention to a specific part of the Inquisition that's referred to as the Spanish Inquisition. In fact, it was such an egregious part of the Inquisition that it sometimes uh, is seen as the whole of the Inquisition. When people talk about Inquisition, they think first and foremost of the Spanish Inquisition. So there's a lot to say about it, and I'm looking forward to having that conversation with Pastor Greg Axe, pastor of Crest Bible Church, also professor of church history here at LFBI, and also the author of the book, uh, Church History. So with that, Greg, Good to be here again, as Welcome. always. Yeah, Appreciate it's fun, Appreciate the opportunity man. to spend time together talking about history and the Word of God and things like that. History is such an awesome thing. When you get beyond the boring um, details of the of our professors and our church history, te our history teachers in school yeah. in various different forms, we'll explore that today. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. You know, one of the things I... I realize about learning history, especially learning it with you over the years, has been that the more I enjoy history, the more that I grow familiar with the principles, mm -hmm. the more I actually enjoy the facts and the figures. Yes. Yeah. Like we've got everything in reverse. You mm -hmm. do all the memorizing of the years and the yeah. dates and the names, and then you lose out on the principles um, because it's secondary. But if you reverse that and you talk about the principles and the ideas first, the concepts behind history it makes the facts and the figures much more fun. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll touch on a couple of those before we're done tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's start the conversation about the Spanish Inquisition by introducing King Ferdinand and his wife, Isabella. Right. Who, who were they, um, and why are they important to beginning uh, this dialogue? Well, obviously, they're the king and queen of, of the nation of Spain. Okay. And here's where I just touched on a minute ago. One of those facts of history come rolling back into our head. Uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and when? 1492. Of course. See, we are supposed to remember that and memorize that sure. in, in history. And who cares? You know, that was 500 years ago. Who was it that financed their project? It was Isabella and Ferdinand mm -hmm. because Columbus was Italian, went to the Italian government and the, and the Catholic Church and tried to get funding for his trip to the New World, and they wouldn't do it. So he went and sailed under the flag of Spain because mm -hmm. Ferdinand and Isabella did it for him. Uh, they are the king and the queen of, of the nation of Spain. And they wanted to consolidate their power because when you get in a position like that, you want to maintain that position. Mm -hmm. That's what you see dictators in the world today, doing everything right. they can to maintain their own power base at the expense of whatever. It, it doesn't matter. Kill our own people as long as I maintain my power base. And that's what they wanted to do. And the Inquisitions was a very powerful tool for them to be able to consolidate their power and control over the country and then maintain everybody underneath their oppression and lockdown of, yeah. of Inquisition. But they are the king and the queen who financed Columbus's venture over here. And at the same time, all that's going on, here comes the Spanish Inquisitions. Yeah, so these were very they were very ambitious power couple, if you will. Yes. They and were like um 
Did you ever watch the old Pinky and Brain cartoons? Yeah, yeah. What are we going to do tomorrow night? Take over the world? They were the type that wanted to yeah. take over the See, world. See, I was going to say they were more like Jay-Z and Beyonce, but, uh, you know. Same, yeah. same, similarities. Same. Take yeah. over the world. That's, yeah, yeah, taking over the world is the is the primary is the objective. Yes. And so even with Columbus uh, going, the, the idea was that they wanted to control large swaths of the yes. Americas. Right. I mean, that was the, that was the idea. Mm-hmm. And so here we are with those ambitions on display. These are yep. extremely Catholic individuals oh, in terms of much. their in terms of their background and religious behavior. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so with that, they're using, they're going to use their Catholicism to mm-hmm. justify all kinds of things. So maybe talk about that. Well, again, it's back to the kingdom theology that we talk about. The the church and the and the state are one and we are dominating uh, the world through that particular institution. You have the the feudal system that is prevalent during this particular time mm-hmm. where the elites are at the top and the masses of the people are underneath them are completely impoverished and dominated and controlled by the state and have no liberty or no movement between uh, area, no, no opportunity to expand and grow themselves. Uh, it's all lockdown power, mm-hmm. um, control, and everything like that. And then um, in order to keep the lid on it, they... Um, they launched these things called the Inquisitions. It also factors into history this way, that the dawning of the Reformation is on the horizon. Mm -hmm. um, The church has been controlling the world for a thousand years, and it hasn't worked. Right. And after a while, people are kind of going, you know, (laughs) something's wrong here. Yeah. The Crusades were supposed to be a, a, a victory, and they turned into an abject, miserable failure. This was supposed to be better, and it didn't. And right. for a thousand years, we have lived under this mess. Martin Luther comes along in 1517, 15, 1492 is when Columbus sails. There, This is happening at the mm-hmm. same time. Mm-hmm. And the enemy behind these people, Satan, sees the dawning of the Reformation coming and goes, uh-oh, I better lock it down. Mm-hmm. And that's where a lot of the Inquisition thing stems from as well, of trying to keep the control of the masses through this system of oppression and tyranny and reign of terror that is unequaled. I I don't even think Islam today, um, they would look back at the Inquisitions and go, we're not doing what we do very well. Yeah, um, it was a reign of terror that makes Islam today look like Girl Scouts. Yeah, it, the the and it built upon the authority already established by the Roman Empire, yes. right? And so yes. it was, you know, it had it had done all the heavy lifting. Mm-hmm. The papal authority rose up in the midst of you know an empirical uh, an empirical reign that we've never seen the likes of, you know, since that day. Yeah, it's yeah. you know one of the greatest world powers of of all of human history. Yeah. And that inquisition was just brutal. And you know, one of the things you talked about, we are going to do some episodes in the future on the reformation, which mm-hmm. should probably, it'll probably cover an expanse of many different episodes. Yeah. But one of the things that you mentioned was Martin Luther. And I think it's interesting that prior to Martin Luther, all of these sects that were, you know, we can, we could differentiate between, you know, uh, sm- small issues and sure. big issues and, but a lot of these sects of Christianity that were popping up that were considered heresy by the Catholic Church were common people mm-hmm. uh, outside of the Catholic system trying to establish what they saw as a more biblical form of Christianity. Yes. That's A lot of them were working towards that. It took a Martin Luther who was within the system, mm-hmm. within the infrastructure, that ultimately had the ability to bring down that, that power and, and start something new. Yes. So that's I think that's a really interesting point that you— you kind of pointed at. But it's on the horizon. Mm-hmm. It's Four- right there. 1480 is when the Inquisitions were formally launched. And 1492, Columbus sails. And 1517, Martin Luther. All this is happening yeah. at the same time. Right. And that's in anticipation of what he sees coming. We better lock this thing down. Yeah. So the Spanish Inquisition begins with Ferdinand and Isabella mm-hmm. making requests on the, on the Catholic Church would you extend to us the authority to do our own inquisitions yes. here in Spain? Mm-hmm. What did that look like and what were the motivations behind that? Well, and the motivation is to get it more centralized and more localized mm-hmm. with a, uh, uh, in each country, in each uh, region and area, rather than have it come from Rome. Rome's a long way from Madrid and 
you know, at the time, of course, the only travel is horse or foot. So mm -hmm. um, if we can centralize this and localize it and get it more close to home, we can enforce it a little bit better. And so obviously the Pope gives grants commit permission to do that because Spain and Rome are, you know, ha hand in glove yeah, yeah. throughout most of history yeah. in Spanish uh, Spain is a heavily Catholic country even to this day, mm -hmm. and during the Dark Ages and bef and and even after that, and even today, if you look at Spain, oh, it's locked in. It's a cultic form of of yeah. Catholicism. Yeah. It's a cultural Catholicism. It's not really even a belief system. It's, right. It looks like, in many ways, if you if you observe it from the outside looking in, it almost looks like a medieval form of of Catholicism. Yeah, it's, it's societal amazing. as well as religious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're looking to consolidate power. Yes. How are they doing that? How, how is the Inquisition going to benefit that consol consolidation of power? Well, it begins with um, what they called an Edict of Grace, mm -hmm. uh, where Ferdinand and Isabella issued that, I think it was around 1480 or so. Uh, and this Edict of Grace essentially was this, if you will rat out your friends and neighbors, we will give you grace. Mm. In other words, the Edict of Grace was given Report to us anyone that you know of who is a heretic. And, and you'll be and pardoned. Them, and you'll be pardoned. But of course, as soon as that person reports someone as a heretic, they get on the watch list. Okay. Mm. Here is, and I'll probably touch on this more than once before we're done, but here is, if you want to call it the dirty little secret, although it's, it's real dirty, but it's not necessarily a secret. Mm -hmm. But the dirty little secret behind the Inquisitions was that it was presented as this attempt to purge the world of heresy from Jews, Muslims, and, and sects, mm -hmm. S-E-C-T-S, mm -hmm. um, Bible-believing groups, independent groups. And 90% of the victims were Catholics. Mm -hmm. Okay? So... It was a reign of terror against its own to keep its own in line. That's that's what it really was, right. and yet presented as, well, we need to purge all these radical things out on the fringe. So if you'll report this radical guy out on the fringe, um, then we can arrest them and try them under our inquisition. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you do that, how did you know that? Mm -hmm. Who you've been involved with? Yeah. Yeah. And they get on the watch list, and like I said, 90% of the victims of the Spanish Inquisition were Catholics. Yeah, that's amazing. And so they're looking, now we'll come back to this, that they're mm -hmm. looking to do this Inquisition with the intention of confirming the, the sanctity of the Catholicism in Spain. Yes. Which, again, Catholicism in Spain is equated to the power and the reign of the monarchy. Yes. But they're, they're one and the same. That perspective feeds into it. Mm -hmm. um, there is also the the idea of asserting authority, keeping people in line, but also the scramble to get lands. Because again, penance results in uh, mm -hmm. handing over your lands and your possessions to uh, to the government. Mm -hmm. Essentially, they're the ones that are going to receive all of the benefit of the accusations. As soon as somebody is accused of being a heretic, they get arrested sometimes in the middle of the night. Um, and it, it was men and women both, but typically, basically, the man of the yeah. house would be arrested in the middle of the night. And now you've got the woman and their children, and they've got no provider anymore. And on top of that, the Catholic Church would say, well, because you're a heretic, we get, we get the right to seize your property. And they would boot the woman and the and women and children out. They would be destitute and homeless and orphaned and all that kind of stuff. And they would seize the property. Mm -hmm. And that that's the Catholic Church is the richest institution in the history of the, church, of the world by far. Mm -hmm. They are far more wealthy than any government in this world. And it's a result of a lot of those kind of things where they just stole whatever they could get their hands on. Yeah. And most of it was the land and the property of, of the victims of Inquisition. Now, and in, in one of the things that's unique about this particular Inquisition is that it seems to target Jews and Muslims mm -hmm. at a higher rate than the Inquisition had throughout Europe as a whole. Yes. And um, I think this is really significant because at the time there was a huge population uh, in the southern parts of Europe, Spain included, mm -hmm. and Spain primarily, actually, mm -hmm. 
of Muslims and Jews that had migrated over time from the East and from, from the South. Mm -hmm. And so you have this population of people who are Jewish and Muslim that are completely integrated in society. There's middle-class Jewish people, mm -hmm. there's middle-class Muslim people, there's mm -hmm. poor uh, peasant class, uh, you know, uh, Jews and, and Muslims. And they are heavily coerced into conversion. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about can you talk about the dynamic between these uh, Jewish and Muslims and the and the Catholics of the time? What's the dynamic there in the relationship? Well, again, there there are various groups that are pitted against each other, but like you said, it's a coerced conversion where you descend upon a group of people and stick a sword in their throat and say, "You will become Catholic or else." Mm -hmm. And a lot of people would say, "Well, okay, I'll become Catholic, but I'll retain my personal faith on the side." And they didn't. The Catholic Church cared, but they didn't really care as long as they had the allegiance to the yeah. group. Uh, but when you're talking about Jews and Muslims particularly, and even Bible believers, many of them would say, no, um, you know, I still hold on to my, uh, my culture, my religion, my faith, whatever it is, my heritage, especially with the Jewish people. And the Catholic institution at that time uh, had uh, viewed the Jews as... Uh, these are the people that killed Jesus, mm -hmm. okay? So there was hatred against the Jews because of that. Um, again, you see that manifest in the world even to this day. I mean, World War yeah. II and what Hitler did to that group, right? right? Um, so but they were viewed that way. These are the people who killed Jesus, so we're going to have to deal with them because they're not part of the kingdom. Muslims are heathen as far as they're concerned, so we have to eliminate them. And Christians independent Bible believers are heretics, we have to eliminate them. And so you go into a group of people and you want to um, uh, purge that group of people and convert that group of people. Yeah. Um, you will do what we say or else. And in the process of that, when they resist, there's massive slaughter. Uh, in Castile, Spain, um, around this particular time, a group of Jews, about 50,000 of them, were murdered in one campaign to Oh, to purge that particular group because they refused to um, submit and go along and become Catholic. Yeah. Okay. So, so we have the. Um, I know you're referring to this. The Alhambra decree mm -hmm. was that decree that was the coercion. Like it was a, it was a convert or else. Convert or el or be banished. Yeah. And again, nothing new under the sun. Acts chapter eighteen verse two tells you that Caesar had banished all the Jews from Rome. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is yeah. They're, they're common. They, they had been through this in history as a people group. Uh, yes. And so that with that threat, it, these are people that are fully integrated in the society. Yeah. They were like, sure, I'll convert. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. a lot of them just raised their hand and said, yeah, I'll do right. that. It doesn't make any difference to me. I'll, I'll, I'll practice my Judaism or I'll practice Islam in private. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as these people are concerned, I'll go along to get along. But then the Inquisition came in and it made it a, a part of its platform was to find these people that had verbally committed right. to convert, but were practicing in, in, in silence or in quiet. Mm -hmm. And they went after those folks heavily. Yes, and to smoke them out and to deal with them. And at the same time, and again, this is the dirty little secret portion, the same time is to lock down the Catholic population mm -hmm. and make sure that they understood that they were the target of this, and they better not depart from their Catholicism or else they were going to get it as well. Mm -hmm. And that's why 90% of the victims were Catholics. Mm -hmm. They didn't care. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, when you read about the Spanish Inquisitions too, you, you begin to discover that a lot of the targeting was not on the poorest, mm -hmm. uh, the poorest individuals. Mm -hmm. It was more towards the middle class individuals. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the, the supposition is that it's because they are the ones that were holding land and 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 had something to give to the government, and right. so the targeting was particularly heavy on that that middle class of of individuals that are mm -hmm. Jew or Muslim or whoever who begin to establish their own you know financial worth exactly. in the society. Yeah, and it was a small segment of population. Mm -hmm. we, th we when we say middle class, we're thinking of where we live today, where the bulk of of people in the United States are middle class. Right. Okay. You've got a few elites at the top. You've got some people that are poor. Yeah. But, you know, 80% of us are somewhere in that middle class area. Right. This was is a small group. It was a small group. And there's okay. reason to believe that they were targeted. Yeah. And they were targeted specifically mm -hmm. as well as others. So 
when these, we talked about this a little bit in the other episode, and um, I think it's worth mentioning again what these people had to endure in order um, to either escape death uh, or retain some sort of, um, you know, dignity. Mm -hmm. And so when the accusations would come, it was just like in the last episode, the accusations would come into a community um, and, and the tribunal would be made, made aware of some sort of heretical, you know, uh, activity somewhere in, the, in, in, in within that community. Mm -hmm. They would be made aware of that and then they would do some sort of judicious process. A little bit of investigation. Investigation. Or, um, um, not necessarily even investigation. They would just target people and um, sometimes indiscriminately or randomly make an example out of this one to put the fear of God into mm -hmm. all of their neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, so quite often it was an arrest in the middle of the night. If somebody, people would be suspected of, of, main, of having heretical positions or being in opposition to what was going on, nothing was ever proven. There was no evidence gathering. It just right. you would find yourself get on a list somehow, mm -hmm. and once once a person got on that list, they were eyeballed and they were watched. And if they could find some sort of reason, maybe even they didn't find didn't matter right. if they had a reason or not. Sometimes we look at this thing and says, "Well, that doesn't make any sense." Well, no, it makes perfect sense when you understand who's behind it. Because mm -hmm. if you're trying to make sense out of what Satan's doing, we need to talk. Yeah, right. and people would be targeted. And then they never knew when it was going to happen. And here comes the middle of the night. Come with us, sir. Mm -hmm. Why? You even need to ask. And yeah. three in the morning, rousted out of bed, thugs would break into the house if they had to, to grab the man and pull him out. And when it happened, mom and, and children knew exactly what was going to happen. They knew they would never see dad again. Yeah. They knew somebody was coming back the next day to, to, to take their property. They would be homeless, destitute, widows, orphans, and the man would, would be gone. And he would not know what the accusations were. He would not know if he was ever going to get out, which he never did. Uh, when you look at the inquisitions and see who was arrested and who, who escaped them, less than one-tenth of one percent of people who were actually apprehended ever escaped. Mm -hmm. Once they were apprehended, they were done. It was over with. It was just a matter of time before they would, um, they would execute that individual on charges of heresy. Whether it was true or not didn't matter. Yeah. yeah. History, uh, a lot of history points to exactly what you're saying. The Catholic Church... You know, we'll talk about this at the end, but the Catholic mm -hmm. Church has spun the history on the Inquisition quite a bit. Oh, yeah. And uh, we, we'll hit on that. But, but you know, one of the things we talked about in the last episode was uh, the torture aspect of the yes. investigation. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we were gentle in that episode. Mm -hmm. I want to be a little bit more explicit about what that entailed because the torture mechanisms of the Spanish Inquisition set it apart. Yes. Uh, it was particularly uh, barbaric, Yes. and torturous in its behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and the Inquisitions really employed torture, maybe at an even higher level than what you would have seen previously. And so you have uh, these different uh, techniques that they were using. They were using something called the strapado. Uh, apparently what they would do is they would strap you to a tree by your hands mm -hmm. and you would hang but uh, for long periods of time. But the, the thing about it that was unique yeah. was that they hung your, your hands from behind your back. And so your hands are behind your back, they're tied behind your back. And so the idea was that it would, it would tear your muscle and pull your arms out of the, yeah. of, of the sockets until right. you, you dropped. And, and sometimes they'd tie boots or heavy rocks around your feet to expedite that process. Or, you know, I think a lot of people are familiar with like the rack. Mm -hmm. The rack was a, was a mechanism used yeah. to, to pull people. You know, you'd lay, lay down on a table and they'd, they'd strap you up and then they'd slowly stretch you. And mm -hmm. these, are, these are torture devices that were perfected in the Inquisition, it was it was a terrible, terrible time. It was horrible. Now, on that subject, there is a uh, in downtown Lima, Peru. There is a Catholic cathedral there, and in the basement of that Catholic cathedral, there is a museum to the Spanish Inquisitions and the tor torture methods mm. that are there. Uh, I've been there to that cathedral. I've toured that museum. I've seen wow. it with my eyes. Um, there were all sorts of different 
uh, implements used. You mentioned the rack. I've seen that with my eyes, where they put you on the rack and hand, hand, foot, foot, and then just start pulling until mm. thing until bones would dislocate, and you would scream in agony and uh, okay, 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 I'm a heretic. Right. Uh, they didn't care. They wanted the confession, um, whether it was true or not, didn't matter. Um, I've seen the pendulum. Um, torture method. I don't know if you're familiar no, with that no. one or not. They strap you on a board um, face up and you're, you're you're locked in. You're tied to that thing. And there's this pendulum thing with a blade on the end of it that swings like this. And it's designed every time that it swings to come closer and closer and closer and closer. And eventually, if you don't, if you don't um, confess, it'll slice you in half. Mm. I've seen that with my own eyes. In the in this museum, there's a great big, huge circular area with a stone wall, huge thick stone wall that sits about you know, yay high to the average person. Uh, and it's round stone wall like that. It's a good 30 to 40 feet across in diameter. And in the middle of that is a pit that they say they don't know how deep it is. Uh, and it's filled with bones, human bones. Mm. Okay. And you can stand at that at that wall and look over that and you can see the human bones of the thousands of people who gave their lives um, in, in the Spanish Inquisitions. Again, 90% of them Catholic, they didn't care. It's the reign of terror to keep your people in line. Um, carved into the, the limestone walls of this basement, this is the one that really gripped me the most, um, are little cutout areas um, that are I, that are just, you know, a couple feet, th three or four feet high, something like that. And it's cut out just enough in there where you can shove a person into that. And there's a gate that comes across, like a prison bar gate uh, that comes across that uh, area. And then you lock them in. It's like putting somebody in prison. But it's an area that is there's no just mobility. small enough for you to crouch down like a catcher like a baseball catcher, and they'd shove those people in there and lock them in there, feed them just enough, to leave them in there for months uh -huh. at a time. If you're crouched down in that position for that period of time, um, you can't sleep. You sleep in that position. You eat. They'd feed them just enough to keep them alive. Uh, people would soil themselves in that position, and they would be in – and. Most people would lose their minds in that particular, trying to exact a, a confession out of them. Sometimes they would leave them in there for months at a time and then let them out. And of course, they're crippled in an agony and their mind is gone because they've been tormented for all that period of time um, in, 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 in that thing, just to try to exact a, a torture um, confession out of them. And all of that stuff is there in that museum. And like I said, I've seen it. Wow. With my eyes, it's, it's incredible and and terrible, terrible, it's horrible. And the people that would die in yeah. captivity in 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 mm -hmm. prison, um, and this is particularly, you know, this you might be able to give us some co context for this, but but to be cremated as a Catholic is is actually um, it's like a faux pas. That's a that's a right. big time no no. And so right. they would, if you were in prison, they would and you died, they would cremate your body, which mm -hmm. was a uh, you know. Um, a slap to the face, you know, is an it, insult it, to injury. It's akin to um, what we did when we captured, killed and captured Osama bin Laden and tossed him into the Persian Gulf. Mm -hmm. As an it's offense a against the very offensive. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so that was com that was common for people who didn't make it through even right. just the imprisonment. Right. You know, um, right. hard to survive some of the stuff that you described. Yeah, and 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 that's just. It's been years since I've been there, but I saw the various different torture methods that were there, and it's just unspeakable. Hey, we want to stop the show for just a second and introduce you to one of our Living Faith Bible Institute students. Hi, my name is Miles Cheadle and LFBI is an incredible asset for anybody that wants to, to learn and to grow in their knowledge of the Word of God and not just that, but to apply it uh, in ministry and to grow as a minister. Uh, you have incredible uh, preachers and pastors and missionaries uh, that aren't just teaching the Word of God, but they, they live it out in their everyday lives. And so it makes the insights that they share incredibly practical uh, for day-to-day -day ministry. Uh, again, this is a place to, to continually be challenged in the Word. Uh, we don't want to be people that go stagnant in our walks. 
uh, we need to be put in remembrance. And so even if you say, man, I learned these things years ago, well, we need to be put in remembrance and to continue to trust God to grow and to stretch us and to equip us to invest in others. And so if you haven't already, this is something that you want to be a part of. Uh, and so I just I encourage you to consider that. Uh, thank you. Bye. If that interests you at all, please visit lfbi.org and consider enrolling in classes. It's been years since I've been there, but I saw the various different torture methods that were there and it's just unspeakable uh, to even cons- – I, I, again, cannot wrap my head around how human beings can do this to other human beings simply because of what they believe. Well, it goes against the nature that, that God has given us. Absolutely. I mean, even as a lost person, yeah. uh, there's you have to sever your your convictions completely and, and uh, become a reprobate in your thinking in yeah. order to permit or justify – yeah, something this egregious. It, it, it was it was it was incredible. And so, you know, some people would confess. Mm-hmm. Um, what did penance look like? We can we kind of hit on this, but penance would look like any number of things, I, I suppose. Well, it's t- well, it's typically as you mentioned, it's you know, confiscation of cro- property and kicking mm-hmm. the widow and the and and the children. But out. What about the auto de fe? The the confession itself um, was used to execute the prisoner, as as we have mentioned the less than one-tenth of one percent, one out of a thousand who were, ca- once you were captured, you were dead. Mm. Now, if you were Catholic, you could confess to be Catholic and you still got executed. You could confess to be a heretic, you'd still get executed. Um, you mentioned this auto de fe. This was an event that was conducted by Ferdinand and Isabella and others that pr- that uh, came after them, kings and queens who continued the the Inquisition uh, method, where once a person was arrested, then they were convicted, and it could be several years later before that happened. I'll, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself sure. on this. No, let me get ahead of myself and then come back. Okay. The Inquisitions in Spain were abolished in 1820. Mm-hmm. Uh, when they were abolished, there was an Inquisition prison in Madrid, Um, where Inquisition prisoners were being held. There were 21 of them in that prison the day that they finally signed the decree and said, we're not going to do this anymore. They opened those prison doors uh, and let those 21 prisoners out. One of them was scheduled to be executed the next day. Talk about being lucky, if you want to call it that. Sure. Of those 21 prisoners, the the one whose shortest amount of time in captivity was three years. He had no idea where he was. Not not one of the 21 knew what, what city they were in. Um, none of them obviously knew where their families were, if their families were even still alive. Their families didn't know where they were. Um, that's what happened. Once you were arrested, you were detained. No charges were filed against you. You never had any defense. You mm-hmm. were just detained until such time as they figured they wanted to execute you. Jumped ahead, now I'll come back. When that day of execution came along, that was what you referred to as that auto de fe. The auto de fe is a Spanish term means act of faith. <laughs> All right? It had nothing to do with an act of faith. Mm-hmm. But the auto de fe was a public event. It was a... Um, it was their Super Bowl, <laughs> okay. The Inquisition Super Bowl? The Inquisition Super Bowl where they would dress up the defendants or the executed, the people are going to be executed in these wild costumes with demon heads and flames of hell all over them um, and parade them down the street publicly in front of everybody who was there. Of course, it's been three to five to ten years since they were arrested with no trial whatsoever, no charges, no accusation. If they, some tortured, right. some not, but it's, okay, time to execute these 20 or these 50 or these 100 or whatever it, it is. It was a death march. Death march. Yeah. Parade them down the street for everybody to watch and the king and the queen and their pomp and their booth sitting there and their beer, beer vendors coming along selling nachos. And, mm-hmm. you know, it was a big public event. It always happened on a Sunday. Typically, mm-hmm. they would connect it to some um, Catholic saint day. This is saint whatever his name, Mm -hmm. uh, his day. And so we're going to execute all these prisoners and march them down. Their mouths would be gagged um, so that they couldn't speak. Um, 
<clears throat> if a person confessed to be Catholic, they would allow them the privilege of being strangled to death before they got into the fire. But then they light this great big huge public bonfire in the middle of town and tie everybody to the stakes and burn them alive at the stakes. And people would watch and go, yay, this is all. Mm -hmm. How does a normal human being come to the point where he can justify any of yeah. that? Yeah. It simply goes against because, conscience. Yeah. Simply because they happen to disagree with something that you believed, which was 10%. And the other 90%, the dirty little secret were people who were Catholic and they knew they were Catholic. Everybody knew they were Catholic. Everybody knew they were loyal to the church, but we're going to make a public example out of you just because we want to so that the other folks of you will will get this message that you could be next, mm -hmm. okay? Because if all they ever did was execute heretics, the Catholics are going to go, no, I'm fine, I'm safe. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, that fear of that, that reign of terror against its own people to keep them in line was was brutal. Yeah. The Spanish Inquisition, you said that it, it formally ended in 1820. Yes. Um, which means that the Spanish Inquisition itself lasted some 350-ish years. Mm -hmm. The Inquisition itself as a whole lasted 600-some years. About. Um, now, the not long ago, the Catholic Church came out and said, hey, we're going to release the tapes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. We're 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 going to release the documentation. We're going to documentation. declassify yes. the documents. And right. The uh, the documents that they released uh, suggested that the Inquisition um, had 125,000 trials, mm -hmm. and that only one percent of those trials ended in execution. That's a nice little scrub of history, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Nice little rewrite of history. Right. Actually, in reality, there were about 350,000 people in Spain alone mm. who died under the Inquisitions. It's an incredible number of people. Yeah. Yeah. And so obviously that information, the only way to for them to, to deal with that is to rewrite history and to mm -hmm. uh, present a different narrative. And, right. And obviously people who are Catholic are going to tend towards believing you know of what the Catholic Church has to say, and and those of us who are ske skeptical of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. you know, will read history for what we believe it says. And but I think the the thing that we want to get to is that um, despite the formal closure of the Inquisition, uh, there is still a form, yes. an abstract form of Inquisition that we recognize uh, even to today. I mean, in early American history, there were um, there were the witch trials. The witch trials, yes. Which would be akin to that. Maybe people aren't mm -hmm. familiar with that. Maybe you can talk about like, just make mention of the Salem witch trials and how that worked. Salem witch trials, Salem, Massachusetts, the uh, Puritans were there and they were, for lack of a better term, they would kind of be on our side of the political or the religious spectrum. They yeah. were- they would be more akin to Bible believers right. um, than Catholics, uh, and they they thought that there were witches uh, within their um, society and, and and locality, and who knows, probably could have been, maybe I don't know. Yeah, we don't we but don't know, don't know. Uh, but they took the um, uh, admonition and well, the verse in the Old Testament, "Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live," and they took that to an extreme, and again went too far with it, um, and ran around and. and tried to identify some witches and actually executed some of them. And see, here's where here's where this rewrite of history has to be understood correctly you know, with the right prism. 350,000 people in Spain alone died in Inquisitions. And if you expanded that to the entire Inquisition, you're talking about two or three million people who were tortured and put to death and burned at the stake yeah. and all. All the on unspeakable multiple things, even. on multiple continents, and the Salem witch trials was an abuse of that same type of situation conducted by the Puritans, and nineteen witches were put to death. Nineteen, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. And so the Catholic Church says, "What about the Salem witch trials?" Okay, nineteen versus 
four right. million or whatever. Uh, there, there's there's no comparison to it. Yeah. Okay. So um, th- you know that's again another place where that type of mentality creeps into somebody, and they 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 do that opposed uh, opposite from what the Word of God has to say. Mm-hmm. But to, um, to talk to pick up on how the Inquisitions are still kind of here a little bit. Yeah. And back up a little bit and talk about really what happened during it, because there's two elements and aspects of that. One of them is how the Inquisitions is still with us today, and the other one is the reaction to the Inquisitions that forms a lot of our current judicial system in civilized countries. In terms of accountability, you mean? Yeah. So explain. Okay. Exp- start with that. Explain that. How, well, how- okay, the Inquisitions themselves would be, somebody would be targeted, um, the... In secret, the information would be gathered. The secrecy of the court was there. In the middle of the night, come with us, um, arrested with no, what are the charges? Why do you even ask? Mm -hmm. Um, There was no defense allowed. Uh, The witnesses were tortured until they gave a, a confession. They were forced to testify against themselves. Um, Property was confiscated. No witness, no accusers were presented before the individual. Where are my accusers? Mm-hmm. They're not there. Right. Um, can, um, um, they were guilty. They were assumed to be guilty when they showed up at right. their door. Yeah. Okay. They were promised release if they would rat out other people. They would rat out other people, and they were never released. Okay. Mm-hmm. One out of a thousand <laughs> made it out. Um, false witnesses were brought in against them. All of those things were conducted for hundreds of years under the Inquisitions. And when uh, the Reformation takes place and here comes the people over to America and we establish a judicial system, many of those people um, not necessarily lived under that themselves, but it was fresh enough for them and their ancestors had lived under that sure. reign of terror for as long as they did. And when they came over here, they said, no, we're going to set up a, a legal judicial system that uh, that counters that so that that doesn't happen again. Yeah. So we have things like trial by jury of your peers. We have things like Miranda rights and what are the charges. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have things like Defense attorney will be prov- provided for you, even if you can't afford one. A court-appointed attorney will be mm-hmm. provided. We have things like you're innocent until proven guilty um, in our system. We have, as you mentioned in our last episode, we would rather, uh, although we you want you want it to be a hundred percent, but man can't ever do anything hundred percent. You would rather let a guilty person go free than let an, than have a innocent person be. Right. Wrongly cr- accused, and right. I, I, that's called innocent until proven guilty. Right. Yeah. Okay, um, talk about badgering the witness in court. <laughs> okay, right. put them on the rack until they confess. That's yeah. kind of badgering the witness, right? Uh, forced to testify against themselves. We have the Fifth Amendment of our Constitution mm-hmm. that says you can you you do not have to testify against yourself. So many of the legal aspects of Good common sense legal jurisprudence that are built into our system are a are a direct consequence of the reign of yeah. terror for th- hundreds of years that that gripped Europe and Spain especially, and resulted in where we are today. Yeah. But then that morphs over time mm-hmm. to get us to where we are today with a lot of the behind the scenes inquisition yeah. that's still happening. And so you know, I think what you're saying is really interesting. I think there's some historical things to point out because. Uh, you know, even the, the the separation of church and state mm-hmm. is a critical component to our uh, American, um, you know, governmental system. Mm-hmm. And that is a very, uh, that is also in response to, you know, such uh, activity as the Inquisition. You've yes. got, you've got men like John Locke and mm-hmm. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, these, mm-hmm. these philosopher slash politicians mm-hmm. who, like you said, they're they're birthed from the Enlightenment, right? Mm-hmm. This post Renaissance, post medieval way of thinking. Logicians, uh, they're reasonable, and they're looking to form a government that looks counter to the to the governmental structures and hierarchies that they've seen in the past. Yeah. And and so America becomes the great experiment of whether or not a true democratic republic will work, and if and if 
these types of ideas will persist. And, yeah. and for the most part, despite how wicked America is in their own way, mm -hmm. um, they've seemed to work at least as a system. Yeah, the system works as, as good as man can come up with. Yeah, of course, right. God's system is different it's, than it's that. preferable. Yeah. He'll set it up when he comes back soon. Yeah. Um, but as far as a human system, it's, it's workable. Yeah, it it's may definitely, not be the only one, but it's workable. It's definitely not the Spanish Inquisition. No. And it's a reaction <laughs> not yet anyway. to that. Not yet. Right. Like I said, it's a reaction to that that's yeah. built within our jurisprudence system to this day. Now, you, you mentioned, made mention to uh, our contemporary cultural inquisition. Yes. And, and I think this has everything to do with the new morality that we face mm -hmm. that I believe is ultimately a... Um, there is an attack. There's an underlying attack against Christian morality and a biblical worldview. Yes, and so I want to hear you address this this kind of new form of Inquisition that exists in our world. Okay, so in the actual Inquisitions, somebody would say something or appear to have leanings toward a particular position mm -hmm. that was contrary to the accepted viewpoint. Okay. Um, today, somebody here's the accepted viewpoint that we call political correctness. Yeah. Okay. And that takes on all sorts of different sure. forms. And just to be clear, um, I, it, I think it's very important for every human being to be as dignified as they possibly can, to be respectful of other people, right? To treat other people correctly. Uh, to, you don't have to be an obnoxious jerk to please God, okay? Right. Uh, so some of our really radical anti-PC people just go a little bit too far with that. And, you know, nobody's going to tell me what to do and I'm going to say whatever. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. I, I'm of that mindset as well, but you don't have to be a jerk right. about it, right. okay? So if something is offensive to somebody, you should be respectful of that. It's a matter not, of conviction. Yeah. Like, Okay. Let's have let's have proper convictions. Sure. Yeah. And if you know that it's offensive to somebody to say something, you know, okay, fine. But this has gone way, way too far. Right. Yeah. Okay. And in the world that we live in, now we have people who, uh, in in the past, if they said something ag against the um, accepted viewpoint and position, they were arrested in the middle of the night, tortured, and put to death. Today, if you say something against the accepted position, you lose your job. Mm -hmm. You don't lose your life, but you lose your job. Right. Just for saying something. Or your show gets canceled. Or, or your show gets canceled. <laughs> or you get marginalized over this way um, to the point where you no longer have your platform or your position mm -hmm. um, that you had before. It, it's, it's very subtle, but it's very much there. The mm -hmm. Inquisitions, those who refuse to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them, and we are repeating in, a undermine, in an underhanded and undermining way, in a very subtle way, a repeat of the Inquisitions that cancels people, offs them, removes them from society because they don't follow along with the politically correct position. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like now virtually every letter of the English language, all 26 of them, have at least one or two words you can't say anymore. There's right? faux pas attached to language and behavior and all, just every turn. You can't do anything right. You're going to offend someone yeah. so, at some point, and there's almost no avoiding it. It's to the point where people who are accusing mm -hmm. are also the accused. Yes. And like it turns around, it's a cycle that's almost unending. And once you begin um, inquiring, right, uh -huh. uh, it's only a matter of time until you're inquired against. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what happened. Quite a, Edict of grace. You, you, you read out this person, mm, now you're on the target yep, list. Yep. Okay. And it just... It, it it's finding its way back into our society over the last couple of generations with the political correct movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and it's and it's a, a problem. And I do believe at the heartbeat of it, um, you know, if you if you go, you peel back the layers and layers and layers, mm -hmm. there is a a concerted effort to 
um, call biblical teaching mm-hmm. and a biblical world, worldview hate. Exactly. Right. And so if mm-hmm. if if the system, if Satan's system, if the world system can turn good bad mm-hmm. and bad good, then they're winning. Uh, and because it puts every Christian uh, in a position where they're having to defend what they believe as mm-hmm. as wi- uh, you know as accused of being wicked or or heretical to the culture itself. Yeah. And so if you say something against a particular sin, that's hate speech, mm-hmm. and you can be denied now your tax exempt status as a church, or mm-hmm. you can you know be lose your job. Yeah. Or you know, those are. Inquisition methods. And these are, and these, okay, the thing that people need to understand is these aren't theoretical. We're not talking about the theoretical ideas, right. okay? And I think people can see it in their culture. Someone's show gets canceled or they see, they know cancel culture exists. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, people don't know that there are real political concerted efforts to make certain biblical teachings mm-hmm. illegal. Yes. Like, yeah. And we're talking about not just in North America, but even people who hold those positions of, in power here in the United States would mm-hmm. love to see certain things that pastors preach every Sunday across America uh, become hate speech and and we're, we become disallowed to, to preach that. There is a law in the books in California that says that you cannot counsel a teenager uh, uh, about his, about homosexual Yeah, sexual orientation. Sexual yeah, yeah, orientation. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's common. And that's in big in Canada right now. The things that They've they've pigeonholed it. They call it conversion therapy, yeah, uh, which is a misapplication of the, of of mm-hmm. what actually many Christians are doing. Um, biblicists should be allowed to counsel from the Bible mm-hmm. and teach what the Bible says. And so, if someone sits down with a pastor and uh, wants counsel, and um, the pastor is led to address something from the Bible, they shouldn't be criminalized for that. Exactly. Uh, that is not. That is not the society that um, I, that John Adams set out to create. No, I don't believe. No, not at all. And yet, here we are. We're facing it that mm-hmm. that there are there is legislation that is creeping into our system of government that's saying that there's certain things that that you shouldn't be allowed to preach, teach, or counsel. Mm-hmm. Um, you you become an enemy. You become an enemy of the right. state, and they become watched. And pretty soon, I don't. Of course, you know we don't know, but. It obviously has not reached the point of the Spanish Inquisition, but it is subtly behind the scenes the same principles right. and the same yeah. concepts. Yeah, and I think it is worth noting is that in the 1960s, um, the the concept of the Inquisition mm-hmm. was reaffirmed in the Catholic Church. Yes, uh, through an entity that they refer to as the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, which is basically a wing of the Catholic church Mm -hmm. that is devoted to rooting out heresy in the Catholic church worldwide. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, there's a funded arm of the Catholic church that is still practicing some form of inquisition even today. Now, how that works, I don't know. I'm not a Catholic. I I don't either. It's, you know, it's it's part of the Vatican council that happened in the sixties, but yeah, it's the re reestablishment. If the Inquisitions formally began in 1480 or so with the Holy Office, Thomas de Torquemada, the first Inquisitor General, mm-hmm. um, burned 2,000 people at the, at the stake on the to celebrate his appointment to the position. Yeah, you write about Torquemada in the book. Yeah, in the church history book. <laughs> okay. And if that remained in effect until 1820 when it was finally abolished, legally abolished, then... Here we go another 140 years later, reinstituting it on a different f- platform, a different um, method that is more subtle and behind the scenes than overt, but it is still there. Yeah. And, you know, without going too far down this rabbit hole, mm-hmm. um, leaving space uh, for such things uh, is convenient to the— uh, to an eschatological time frame, yes. you know, like there's a there, there are things that have yet to transpire that mm-hmm. will demand uh, such loopholes in um, in religious governance. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> the Inquisition is not done. It's not done. I'm, it's back I'm, there, I'm, and I'm and, thankful we won't have to see it. Yes, and it's leading us into ultimately into the tribulation period mm-hmm. when the lockdown. Then, if we thought, like I like I, I mentioned. 
the Muslims today have a have a lockdown mentality, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. Inquisition mentality. Yeah. The Inquisitions themselves, especially the Spanish Inquisitions, make the Muslims look like Girl Scouts. Mm -hmm. And when the tribulation comes around and the Antichrist does his lockdown, it'll make um, oh, yeah. Ferdinand and Isabella look like Girl Scouts. Yeah, yeah. It, the, these are all shadows of a of a thing to yes. come. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've this topic. We didn't do it justice. No. But I think we did do a, a decent job of kind of covering in two episodes um, the the nature of the Inquisition and, mm -hmm. and how it was used and give give people again those principles necessary to walk away with. Mm -hmm. Feel like we did a good job. Yeah. If that. It, as long as somebody can come away with this understanding that, oh, that's something that happened a long time ago. Um, yeah. History repeats itself. Yeah. Right. And if we don't learn the lessons from history, we're going to repeat them, and we are slowly repeating them. And um, if, if we understand enough of that, we can go back and look at what, what took place in history and examine where we are in life mm -hmm. today and at least see some insights into it and go, okay, well, I understand where that's coming from. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Why, why does somebody lose their job because they say something that is not offensive, right? but it offended somebody? So they, why does, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, yeah, it does. Right, Yeah. No, very, very, very interesting. And um, I think this marks the beginning of us going into the Reformation mm -hmm. conversation. I yeah. think from here, we're going to get to talk about um, all of the complex things that happened in the Reformation. So yeah, our listeners what, should stay yeah, tuned. What a, what, what a fascinating time that yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. And I know that you love talking about Martin Luther, so yes. we'll, it'll be fun getting yeah. into all that stuff. So, yeah. But man, Greg, thank you as always for hanging Appreciate out with it. me. Yeah, always, man. And uh, we want to thank you guys as well for joining us uh, for this episode of The Postscript. If you love history and you love uh, studying about the church and the history of the church, we highly recommend the church history class that is offered uh, almost every other year uh, here in the Bible Institute. So you can jump on next time that gets offered. Pastor Greg will be teaching that class. Not only that, if you don't know, uh, Living Faith Bible Institute has a publishing wing uh, called Living Faith Books, where we publish books. And one of the books that we uh, that we publish and support is the church history book that Greg Axe wrote. Uh, many, many of you already have copies of this. We get feedback all the time on how wonderful pe people love this book. Uh, it's easy to read. It makes history fun. It covers a lot of ground. It provides you with principles for understanding history so that when you read the news or you read history um, in other contexts, uh, you've got the principles necessary to understand that from a biblical perspective. Uh, it's a fantastic book and we highly recommend it. You can find it on Amazon and you can learn about all of our books uh, at lfbi.org. With that, we love you. We're grateful for you and we can't wait to spend more time with you again next week on The Postscript. God bless. Thanks for listening to The Postscript. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating and review in order to help other people find our podcast. If you value this show, please help us continue creating content by supporting Living Faith Bible Institute at lfbi.org support.